Thank you, Lakmal. So um, the next session is going to be, uh, I'm going to talk to you about microservices uh, and how to right size your, your services. Uh, so let me introduce myself again for those of you who joined us uh, later. Uh, so, uh, I'm Vidura Gaminyabe. I head the solution architecture function uh, for the integration business at WSO2. I also work as a field CTO, um, and in my role, um, I work with all the global clients um, and uh, also represent the customers at uh, product design and development uh, in, in, in our product councils as well. Uh, I've been at WSO2 nearly nine years now. Um, a part of it, maybe one third of it, uh, was spent in engineering, and I've been in um, solution architecture since uh, 2018. Right, so um, let's get into the talk. <coughs> so um, the talk is about microservices, so I want to start there um, and, and talk a little bit about what microservices are just to uh, get everybody uh, to the same plane. Uh, so microservices, uh, it's an architecture style where um, an application is basically structured um, as a collection of independent services that are loosely coupled, right? So this architecture was pioneered or introduced mainly uh, by Netflix at the beginning, and then it has caught on um, very... Um, uh, it, it's very popular. Uh, a lot of people want to do this as an architecture uh, for its inherent benefits. So um, there are a lot of benefits to doing microservices or uh, architecting um, your applications using uh, microservices. So first thing is obviously they are loosely coupled. Um, you can, uh, because of that, you can easily uh, manage the dependencies and things like that. Um, and um, they are uh, deployed and maintained independently. So you can have different teams, different people work on these services. Uh, and they also have the ability to scale uh, independently as well. Um, of course, because of the independence that the microservices give you, um, there's no restriction as to what technologies you can use for each of them. So you are free to choose um, any technology that you wish for the different services. So that al allows you to pick the right technology for the right job. Um, and, and that's what I mean by enabling po polyglot development on this slide. Um, and um, because um, these are independent and um, are loosely coupled, that gives you a lot more agility when, you, when it comes to doing releases, doing maintenance, um, and things like that on, on microservices. Um, and um, the other thing that you can do is um, you can align, if, you're, if you have such an architecture, you can easily align that with your organizational structures. Um, as I have um, uh, depicted in the, in the diagram on the screen, um, each microservice can be handled by different teams. Um, and they can do independent releases as long as they maintain the contracts uh, that, are, you know, that are between the services. Uh, so these are these are the fundamental reasons as to why microservices have become so popular. However, as with everything in life, they come with a few catches. So um, we've spoken about the good. So let's look at the bad and the ugly. Um, so. Once you start using microservices and it grows, so as you add more and more services into the mix uh, and the usage increases, um, you are sort of faced with a different set of problems, right? Um, one thing is now, I, I mentioned about um, the, the ability to use different technologies, uh, being independent, uh, and, and being able to develop these independently. So that also means that you have now multiple code bases to manage. Right, um, and of course, as the number of microservices grow, there'll be a, a, a large number of dependencies that come into play as well. Um, and the complexity of the deployment will also increase because now you independently deploy these things. And when you deploy a, a particular microservice, you have to also ensure that whatever that it's dependent on is also properly there and the right versions and things like that, right? So of course, there is a complexity to the deployments. And um, when the number of services increase over time, you also have to monitor to ensure that resiliency, high availability of these services, and things like that are maintained. So there is definitely a monitoring overhead here as well compared to others, right? Or compared to having a, a single uh, service uh, doing everything. Um, and then um, 
Each of these services, as you saw on the previous diagram, may have data sources um, associated with them. So which also means now you have to um, associate or, or rather maintain data consistency across these services. There could be different relationships between the data across the services as well. So you have to ensure that is managed as well. Right? And then all of these services communicate through the network. So which also means that there, is a, there can be a communication overhead, right? So some of these things are, are making uh, microservices a, a little, or people rethink about uh, microservices, because as, as you grow the number of microservices and have more and more being added to your portfolio, you can end up something like this, right? So this is uh, the microservices dependency graph from Netflix, right? Um, they have thousands of services that are independent, dependent of each other, and uh, it can be a very complex um, uh, situation for you to manage, right? So um, what do people do about this? Some people have rethought about their um, strategy uh, when it comes to um, structuring applications, and we can see some of rethinking and going back to basics. And what do I mean by that? Some people are now going back to the monolith days, right? So we, we um, went outside of the monolith or uh, ditched the monolith away uh, to see that, okay, microservices are, are much better than this. But now they have realized there are certain salient properties in the monoliths that makes it actually quite nice to use, right? So these are two popular news items that were making headlines um, last year. Um, where um, Amazon basically dumped uh, or their, their architecture that they had for microservices and then uh, went with uh, a, mon a monolith-based service, right? Or monolith-based architecture for this. Um, and as a result, there are a, a lot of people rethinking about this approach, right? So um, uh, he, he has, here's a very nice quote uh, from Sam Newman, who has written several books about uh, microservices. Um, so according to this quote, so he says, a monolith architecture is a choice and a valid one at that, right? It may not be the right choice in all circumstances, um, any more than microservices are, but it's a choice nonetheless. So what, what he's trying to say here is that while we talk, you know, we, we say that microservices are really good, um, don't forget that a monolith is also another option, uh, and a viable option for that matter, and it's still valid up to today, right? Uh, so I, I, I thought that's a, that's a very interesting quote coming from a guy who's writing a book about microservices, right? So um, why do people look at the monolith again uh, this way? So there's obviously um, a simplicity, I would say, is the main reason for it, because there are inherent advantages when you go with something like a monolith. Um, it is favored by many because with the monolith, there's a single code base to manage, right? And uh, if you have a single code base, obviously you deploy this also as, a, as one unit, so there is a simplicity in the deployment also. Right, and then um, you may have uh, different modules uh, in your design of the mon of this monolith or in inside the monolith, um, and all of these modules can be um, communicating with each other internally, right, within the process. So that makes it a lot more performant than going over a, a network, right. So that benefit is also there in a monolith. And of course, just being a single unit of deployment, single unit of code, there's also ease of management, right? And then, excuse me, it's easier to test. And if you start with something like this, you start off with a single technology, um, there's a, a lower initial cost for you to start. So these are some of the benefits that we've seen um, you know, in monoliths. Um, and, and this is also why um, people are thinking about this once again. Um, so we moved out of the monolith to microservices because of several reasons, as we discussed, right? But we are now seeing certain benefits in, um, in the monolith. So what if we can, or, is, or rather, is there a, a best of both worlds? Can we go hybrid? Uh, an option that has the simplicity of the monolith uh, and the flexibility of the microservices. Is there such an option? There apparently is. There's something called the modular monolith that, is, uh, that people are now working on and is becoming a very uh, popular architectural style. Um, so um, I'm sorry, the, some of the bullet points have 
uh, hidden under the, the diagrams because when we converted this to PowerPoint, I think there has been a, some problem. But anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, so what, what is a mod modular monolith? So a modular monolith is, um, it, it, is, it has a single code base, but it has also different modules within that single code base that are loosely coupled. Um, and how do we make that loosely coupled? We um, use something like an um, uh, API interface for this, right? And then um, they always talk through APIs. Um, and then there's a single code base to maintain. Uh, modules can be, so as, as I've shown on this diagram, you can start off with, um, you can start off with something like, like this where you have a couple of modules talking to each other through um, API interfaces. You can start off like this, but as you progress and as you see that some of these modules need uh, scalability on their own or independent deployment, you can easily re um, take them out of the monolith purely because they are loosely coupled, right? And then deploy them separately as I have shown on this diagram. Um, and um, if, you, if you do it like that, um, you, or, uh, in, in, at least in my opinion, you get the best of the both worlds, right? So um, you may start off with a single code base um, and then um, loosely couple modules and then later on you move the modules out or separate them out as and when needed um, and then you can deploy independently. And when they are within the monolith, in, in this initial stage, although they talk to each other through APIs, uh, depending on which technology, which language you use, it may go through the, the local uh, transport. And that might still give you a better performant, performance than uh, the latencies that are over a network, uh, as in this case, where you may have these services deployed uh, on different, um, different machines, for example. Right? So the modular monolith has this, um, um, uh, in my opinion, the best of both worlds. So this is definitely an option that you can consider um, if you want uh, something in between that has both um, benefits. Right? So um, the main subject of this talk is about right sizing services, right? So how do you pick the right service or right size for your needs? Um, and I'd like to present you um, what I call as the right sizing spectrum, right? So on, on this side, we have the monolith. On the other side, we have microservices. And I'll talk a bit about serverless as well, because that is also another way of doing services that are becoming very popular. So. Um, on this side, so as you go on to that, that side or to the, to, the, uh, to the right, the granularity of the services and the um, independence of the modules increases. Um, and when you come to the left side, the simplicity increases, right, in this spectrum. Um, so you have on, on the uh, left corner, you have the monolith. We spoke about it. There's a single code base, single deployment. There, it's very easy to manage. Um, and, and this might be a great place for you to start when you um, develop an application. Um, but if you're a bit forward thinking and you want to actually get the benefits of microservices at some point, you may opt to start with a modular monolith, right? Where you start off by making your uh, modules a little bit more loosely coupled. Um, and um, uh, you have a best of both worlds here. You can have a single code base and a single deployment here at the beginning. And as, I, as we discussed earlier, um, you can, um, you know, uh, take these out, these modules out, and scale them independently as we go on. Right, so then we have microservices, um, obviously independently um, uh, deployed, independent modules. They are, you know, if you want something uh, with better scalability, uh, if you want your teams or to use different technologies for each of these services, you can go for that option or start with that option. Um, and that will give you the ultimate uh, in, in agility. Um, and um, like um, what um, um, Lakmal mentioned in his talk, um, you, you can easily um, have some of these things in, in the different domains, and they can be better fit team structures as well, as we discussed in the, in the second slide uh, um, uh, earlier on. Um, so then you have this uh, notion of serverless, um, uh, lambda functions and things like that that are becoming very popular. These are also, in my opinion, another thing that you have to consider. Uh, especially when you have certain uh, things being or certain routines being run on an event, uh, so it on, and, and you need that code to run only on that event, right? Not not regularly, 
so um, if you um, and and uh, for for such options, serverless becomes a, a very good um, alternative as well because you can write you can uh, model it as a serverless function. You can keep it uh, dormant until that event happens, and when that event happens, it it basically runs, and you don't really have to worry about where it runs, right? So it's ideal for self-contained routines. It's cost-effective because you only pay as pay for what you the, the time that you run it for, right? And can be completely event-driven, right? So this is just a guide for you to sort of think about the different options that you may have um, in this in this spectrum. So factors to consider when um, when you uh, pick some of these options. Um, Think about the business needs. Think about the transaction volumes that you want to handle. Um, and think about the different transaction volumes that may, be, uh, may, may have to be catered by the individual modules so that you can size it and then uh, scale them independently. And you may also have some latency requirements where um, if two modules have to talk to each other with minimum latency, then you may have, we may want to combine them together, maybe to a modular monolith or a monolith style, but if latency is not a big issue, you can have the flexibility or the freedom to actually separate them out. Um, and then you also have things like data privacy regulations and things like that, because if you um, have a data source connected to a, a monolith or a um, monolith, and then all the modules probably have access to all the, the, the data in, that is in there. Uh, and you may have to separate some of these data out and have certain guardrails around how you um, access this data. And um, microservices is also a great way to do that as well. Um, then, of course, you have technical characteristics that you have to think about. Um, uh, um, things like payload sizes, uh, the complexity of the logic, um, and, and, and things like that. Uh, when you're handling large payloads, you may have to do certain transformations to those payloads. Um, that could be some heavy lifting that really requires something like that to scale, right, uh, independently. So you may want to structure it that way. Um, and uh, of course, things like fault tolerance and, and, and things like that, you may want to think about as well. Um, what happens if um, uh, one of the systems, are, so say, say for example, if you have a microservices scenario and one of the dependent services fail, what happens for the service that is dependent on it? Uh, how do you cater to something like that? Um, so you have to think about all these uh, technical characteristics as well when you pick these uh, options. Um, and then we come to the, the, the non-technical part of it, um, the team structures and the development practices that you may have in your organization. Um, uh, and, and a lot of the organizations today um, practice uh, agile development. Uh, we talk about two pizza-sized teams um, you know, as a, as a good way to organize things. Um, so if you're taking that approach, um, microservices might be a better approach, or even a, a modular monolith might be a better approach. Um, uh, when you when you want to do that, and then um, of course uh, the skill sets of the team. If you're whether you're using the same technology uh, for everybody, whether you are using uh, different uh, technologies for the different services, um, and then of course develop uh, deployment and the monitoring processes. So all of these things you have to think about um, in picking the um, picking the options. Right. So. Um, uh, here's a here's a famous quote by uh, Martin Fowler, which I'm sure all of all of you know. So he says, "You should not start a new project uh, with microservices, even if you are sure about your application being uh, or your application will be big enough to make it worthwhile." Uh, what he's trying to say with this is that um, even if you're thinking about microservices and to structure it like that. Um, start with a simple approach like a modular monolith, right? Think about starting it like that because that allows you to have that flexibility to move it to uh, um, and ha not have the 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 all the bad things that we spoke about about microservices at the beginning itself, right? So I thought it's a, a very interesting quote to share with you as well, right? So um, how do you approach right sizing, right? Uh, right, how how do you approach right sizing? So my suggestion to you is you start very simple. So you start either with a, a monolith, uh, when you're thinking about an application like this, um, or you can start off with something like a modular monolith, as I said, um, where the modules are loosely coupled. And then you decompose the monolith strategically as you move on with your project, right? So how do you do that? 
Um, there's this very famous um, uh, pattern called the strangler fig pattern. I don't know whether you've seen that before. It's a very interesting uh, pattern. So let me talk a little bit about that, uh, or what, what this is all about. So a strangler fig is a, is a tree. Right, that grows on another tree. So um, in this diagram, the, the one in the green color is the strangler fig. It, it uses a host tree to grow. Um, and of course, it can land on that tree through a bird dropping or something like that. What it does is it sends all its roots to the ground. And once it establishes that, it starts growing little by little, strangling the host tree. And at the end, what you have is the strangler fig and the host tree has died, right? So it's, it's a very interesting concept in nature, um, which is called uh, the strangler fig pattern as a result. And I thought this is, this is a great way to um, uh, actually do microservices uh, or rather decompose the monolith as well, right? So how do you do this with the monolith? So you may start off with a monolith or a, or a modular monolith at the beginning, as I said. And when you think that it's the right time or a part of this monolith can be deployed separately as a microservice, you basically chop it off and then make it a microservice, right? So you're short of shrinking the host or the, the monolith as a result. And you've started off with a microservice now. And then later on, when you, um, when you keep on using this, you may choose to do it again, right? And then the monolith shrinks again, and now you have another mo another microservice that you can manage, right? So and and you can go on like that. You can slowly decompose your monolith into microservices, and and for what it takes, you might um, decide to stop right here and have a part a, a hybrid architecture where part of your architecture is is the microservices, or or, or have a very small monolith running certain things together, right? Or if you if you want to go all the way. You do what the strangler fig does, basically kill the host, right? So after that one point, you only have microservices and your monolith is gone, right? So I thought this is a very interesting um, pattern that's there. Um, uh, it's not something I came up with, obviously. Um, and uh, there, this is a widely used pattern for uh, decomposing the monolith, which I thought was very interesting. Right? So this is something that you can use to decompose the monolith uh, as you go over time. Right. <clears throat> So um, coming back to that same slide, uh, so we spoke about decomposing the monolith strategically using the straggler fig pattern. And then once you have microservices, uh, with time you may realize that certain microservices actually can work together or be combined together uh, as small services, right? And at that point you may want to refactor your microservices to combine them together um, and, and maybe uh, make a slightly uh, like a small monolith. Um, and um, um, we spoke about serverless, what it's good for at certain, you know, for certain tasks. You can um, explore that option for specific tasks if you have um, uh, something that fits it. Um, and uh, in my opinion, going hybrid might be the best way here, where you either start off with a monolith or you know recombine um, microservices together later on based on the usage. Right, so these are some of the uh, techniques and examples that you, I can give you. Um, and um, so, are there are there widely known um, use cases out there that has done something like this? Of course, there are. So, um, for example, PayPal. Uh, is known for adapting microservices architecture alongside a monolith, um, and they approached they approached this with a hybrid approach. Basically, um, allowed them to evolve their architecture, um, where they um, reap the benefits of the microservices for certain things, but they also have the reliability of a monolith for certain things. SoundCloud is an is another one, um, where they evolve their monolith architecture to a hybrid one by um, adapting microservices. Uh, for for certain functionalities, um, for certain functionalities on their platform. So these are two use cases that I found out there that have done something similar and have gone with um, hybrid architectures. So um, yeah. So when you do this, what are the challenges and some of the trade-offs that you have to think about, right? So when you do all of this refract refactoring, um, uh, decomposing the monoliths, uh, combining services, and doing all of this, um, there's a lot of refactoring work that goes on, um, and your developers might feel that okay, refactoring may seem too much be you know too much maintenance work, right? Um, and then um, if you're using 
different technologies for the microservices, different technologies for the, um, uh, you know, the different services, or even for the monolith. Um, there could be different tools that you use, and there could be tooling complexities that come into play as well, because you may not be able to use a single IDE or a single library uh, across all of these. Right? And um, there could be a monitoring overhead, um, where when you have a large number of services, um, you have to monitor all of these as well. Um, and then you have to think about um, you know, agility versus simplicity, as we uh, discussed earlier, scalability versus maintenance, um, and the management complexities um, that come into play. Right? So how can certain technologies help you here? Um, now, if you, if, you, if you look at the WSO2 stack, um, what we discussed today, all of that can be done with the WSO2 technology today. Um, if you were in um, sessions yesterday um, uh, about Ballerina, you, you may have figured out that Ballerina has a lot of capabilities that allow you to do microservices and even maybe combine them later on together to form some of these things, right? Um, if you're interested in knowing more details about those, please um, head over to the, the Oxygen Bar and meet some of the Ballerina team members. They can definitely help you with this. And these overheads of monitoring management complexities and all of that, how do you, um, uh, you know, do we have something for you in there? Of course. If you use a platform like Corio, all of that is completely done for you, right? It's all wired up together. All you have to do is just deploy your services on it, and the dashboards and everything will do all of that for you, right? At least the hard yards of doing that is all done for you. Right? So WSO2 definitely, uh, the technology platform can definitely help you here. Right? Um, so one last comment before I, I wrap up. Um, the first comment, I don't know who the author or the person who made that, but I thought it was a very interesting one. Um, Right-sizing services is like trimming a bonsai tree. Right? Um, those who know bonsai, I'm, I'm sure will understand this. Um, and um, I, I've heard that uh, doing bonsai is very therapeutic as well. Maybe, maybe it is in, in this case as well. Right? So you remove what is unnecessary to cultivate optimal growth and efficiency. Right? Um, and I think that's a great quote uh, about how you should look at this. Um, but this quote by Leonardo da Vinci um, uh, is, is, I thought, is, sums up everything very well, how you should approach this. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, right? So approach anything with that in mind. So one last slide. Um, I want you to um, take this as the key takeaways from this talk. Um, Right-sizing, in my opinion, is very important when you think about this. It's an ongoing process. It's not a one-time decision where you, you know, think about it and then forget about it. Um, start simple. Uh, think about the simplicity, as I said. Uh, proceed with uh, the necessity uh, when you do these things and, and scale accordingly. Consider all factors, business, technical, org structures, um, monitoring, all those capabilities that you need, have, you need to have. Um, and, and there's no one-size-fits-all solution when you want to pick an architecture, right? Um, so you have to start somewhere with something in mind, and along the way that you, you may still change your mind depending on some of the things that you encounter. Um, but what is there for you is a one-size-fits-all platform that can do all of this, and that is the WSO2 platform. Thank you very much.